Hello and welcome to Being Prodigy. Now put on your headphones and start learning. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. To the earlier monotony of bread and potatoes many, though not all, could now add meat and butter and eggs to their diet. Better living conditions promoted social peace within the country and support for imperialism abroad. Late 19th century colonialism trade flourished and markets expanded in the late 19th century. But this was not only a period of expanding trade and increased prosperity. It is important to realize that there was a darker side to this process. In many parts of the world, the expansion of trade and a closer relationship with the world economy also meant a loss of freedoms and livelihoods. Late 19th century European conquest produced many painful economic, social and ecological changes through which the colonized societies were brought into the world economy. Look at a map of Africa, figure 10. You will see some countries' borders run straight, as if they were drawn using a ruler. Well, in fact this was almost how rival European powers in Africa drew up the borders demarcating their respective territories. In 1885 the big European powers met in Berlin to complete the carving up of Africa between them. Britain and France made vast additions to their overseas territories in the late 19th century. Belgium and Germany became new colonial powers. The U.S. also became a colonial power in the late 1890s by taking over some colonies earlier held by Spain. Let us look at one example of the destructive impact of colonialism on the economy and livelihoods of colonized people. Rinderpest or the cattle plague in Africa, in the 1890s, a fast-spreading disease of cattle plague or rinderpest had a terrifying impact on people's livelihoods and the local economy. This is a good example of the widespread European imperial impact on colonized societies. It shows how in this era of conquest even a disease affecting cattle reshaped the lives and fortunes of thousands of people and their relations with the rest of the world. Historically, Africa had abundant land in a relatively small population. For centuries, land and livestock sustained African livelihoods and people rarely worked for a wage. In late 19th century Africa there were few consumer goods that wages could buy. If you had been an African possessing land and livestock, and there was plenty of both, you too would have seen little reason to work for a wage. In the late 19th century, Europeans were attracted to Africa due to its vast resources of land and minerals. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. Europeans came to Africa hoping to establish plantations and mines to produce crops and minerals for export to Europe. But there was an unexpected problem, a shortage of labor willing to work for wages. Then came Rinderpest, a devastating cattle disease. Rinderpest arrived in Africa in the late 1880s. It was carried by infected cattle imported from British Asia to feed the Italian soldiers invading Eritrea in East Africa. Entering Africa in the east, Rinderpest moved west like forest fire, reaching Africa's Atlantic coast in 1892. It reached the Cape, Africa's southernmost tip, five years later. Along the way Rinderpest killed 90% of the cattle. The loss of cattle destroyed African livelihoods. Planters, Mine owners and colonial governments now successfully monopolized what scarce cattle resources remained to strengthen their power and to force Africans into the labor market. Control over the scarce resource of cattle enabled European colonizers to conquer and subdue Africa. Similar stories can be told about the impact of Western conquest on other parts of the 19th century world. Indentured labor migration from India The example of indentured labor migration from India also illustrates the two-sided nature of the 19th century world. It was a world of faster economic growth as well as great misery, higher incomes for some and poverty for others, technological advances in some areas and new forms of coercion in others. In the 19th century, Hundreds of thousands of Indian and Chinese laborers went to work on plantations, in mines, and in road and railway construction projects around the world. In India, indentured laborers were hired under contracts which promised return travel to India after they had worked five years on their employer's plantation. Most Indian indentured workers came from the present-day regions of eastern Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, central India and the dry districts of Tamil Nadu. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support.
In the mid-19th century, these regions experienced many changes, cottage industries declined, land rents rose, lands were cleared for mines and plantations. All this affected the lives of the poor, they failed to pay their rents, became deeply indebted and were forced to migrate in search of work. The main destinations of Indian indentured migrants were the Caribbean islands mainly Trinidad, Guyana and Suriname, Mauritius and Fiji. Closer home, Tamil migrants went to Ceylon and Malaya. Indentured workers were also recruited for tea plantations in Assam. Recruitment was done by agents engaged by employers and paid a small commission. When immigrants agreed to take up work hoping to escape poverty or oppression in their home villages agents also tempted the prospective migrants be providing false information about final destinations, modes of travel, the nature of the work, and living and working conditions. Of 10 migrants were not even told that they were to embark on a long sea voyage. Sometimes agents even forcibly abducted less willing migrants. 19th century indenture has been described as a new system of slavery. On arrival at the plantations, laborers found conditions to be different from what they had imagined. Living and working conditions were harsh, and there were few legal rights. But workers discovered their own ways of surviving. Many of them escaped into the wilds, though if caught they faced severe punishment. Others developed new forms of individual and collective self-expression, blending different cultural forms, old and new. In Trinidad the annual Muharram procession was transformed into a riotous carnival called Jose, for Imam Hussein, in which workers of all races and religions joined. Similarly, the protest religion of Rastafarianism, made famous by the Jamaican reggae star Bob Marley, is also said to reflect social and cultural links with Indian migrants to the Caribbean. Chutney music, popular in Trinidad and Guyana, is another creative contemporary expression of the post-inventor experience. These forms of cultural fusion are part of the making of the global world, where things from different places get mixed, lose their original characteristics and become something entirely new. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. Most indentured workers stayed on after their contracts ended, or returned to their new homes after a short spell in India. Consequently, there are large communities of people of Indian descent in these countries. Have you heard of the Nobel Prize winning writer V.S. Naipaul? Some of you may have followed the exploits of West Indies cricketers Shivnareen Chandrapal and Ramnaresh Sarwan. If you have wondered why their name sounds vaguely Indian, the answer is that they are descended from indentured labor migrants from India. From the 1900s India's nationalist leaders began opposing the system of indentured labor migration as abusive and cruel. It was abolished in 1921. Yet for a number of decades afterwards, descendants of Indian indentured workers, often thought of as coolies, remained an uneasy minority in the Caribbean islands. Some of Naipaul's early novels capture their sense of loss and alienation. Indian entrepreneurs abroad growing food and other crops for the world market required capital. Large plantations could borrow it from banks and markets. But what about the humble peasant? Enter the Indian banker. Do you know of the Shikaripuri Shroffs and Nadu Kate Chachurs? They were amongst the many groups of bankers and traders who financed export agriculture in Central and Southeast Asia, using either their own funds or those borrowed from European banks. They had a sophisticated system to transfer money over large distances, and even developed indigenous forms of corporate organization. Indian traders and moneylenders also followed European colonizers into Africa. Hyderabadi Sindhi traders, however, ventured beyond European colonies. From the 1860s they established flourishing emporia at busy ports worldwide, selling local and imported curios to tourists whose numbers were beginning to swell, thanks to the development of safe and comfortable passenger vessels. Indian trade, colonialism and the global system historically, fine cottons produced in India were exported to Europe. With industrialization, British cotton manufacture began to expand, and industrialists pressurized the government to restrict cotton imports and protect local industries. Tariffs were imposed on cloth imports into Britain. Consequently, the inflow of fine Indian cotton began to decline. From the early 19th century, British manufacturers also began to seek overseas markets for their cloth. Excluded from the British market by tariff barriers, Indian textiles now face stiff competition in other international markets. 
If we look at the figures of exports from India, we see a steady decline of the share of cotton textiles, from some 30% around 1800 to 15% by 1815. By the 1870s this proportion had dropped to below 3%. What, then, did India export? The figures again tell a dramatic story. While exports of manufactures declined rapidly, export of raw materials increased equally fast. Between 1812 and 1871, the share of raw cotton exports rose from 5% to 35%. Indigo used for dyeing cloth was another important export for many decades. And, as you have read last year, opium shipments to China grew rapidly from the 1820s to become for a while India's single largest export. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. Britain grew opium in India and exported it to China and, with the money earned through this sale, it financed its tea and other imports from China. Over the 19th century, British manufacturers flooded the Indian market. Food grain and raw material exports from India to Britain and the rest of the world increased. But the value of British exports to India was much higher than the value of British imports from India. Thus Britain had a trade surplus with India. Britain used this surplus to balance its trade deficits with other countries, that is, with countries from which Britain was importing more than it was selling to. This is how a multilateral settlement system works. It allows one country's deficit with another country to be settled by its surplus with the third country. By helping Britain balance its deficits, India played a crucial role in the late 19th century world economy. Britain's trade surplus in India also helped pay the so-called home charges that included private remittances home by British officials and traders, interest payments on India's external debt, and pensions of British officials in India. The interwar economy the First World War, 1914-1918, was mainly fought in Europe, but its impact was felt around the world. Notably for our concerns in this chapter, it plunged the first half of the 20th century into a crisis that took over three decades to overcome. During this period the world experienced widespread economic and political instability, and another catastrophic war. Wartime transformations The First World War, as you know, was fought between two power blocs. On the one side were the Allies, Britain, France and Russia, later joined by the US, and on the opposite side were the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary and Ottoman Turkey. When the war began in August 1914, many governments thought it would be over by Christmas. It lasted more than four years. The First World War was a war like no other before. The fighting involved the world's leading industrial nations which now harnessed the vast powers of modern industry to inflict the greatest possible destruction on their enemies. This war was thus the first modern industrial war. It saw the use of machine guns, tanks, aircraft, chemical weapons, etc. on a massive scale. These were all increasingly products of modern large-scale industry. To fight the war, millions of soldiers had to be recruited from around the world and moved to the front lines on large ships and trains. The scale of death and destruction 9 million dead and 20 million injured was unthinkable before the industrial age, without the use of industrial arms. Most of the killed and maimed were men of working age. These deaths and injuries reduced the able-bodied workforce in Europe. With fewer numbers within the family, household incomes declined after the war. During the war, industries were restructured to produce war-related goods. Entire societies were also reorganized for war. As men went to battle, women stepped in to undertake jobs that earlier only men were expected to do. This is Being Prodigy. To get special study material, just contact us through the link in the description. And please subscribe to show your support. Thank you and happy learning.